Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timperley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Our special guest today is Shell Hartzer, and we're going to be talking about cockroaches today. So an hour talking about those lovely creatures, cockroaches. So welcome along, everybody. Uh, tell us where you're joining us from in the sidebar. Uh, remind us where you're joining from today, Shell. I am based outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm in, <laughs> did you like that impression? Uh, I'm in Manchester, England, uh, as you may know. Uh, it's lovely to have you on. Uh, Gavin from Toronto, Guadalupe from North Carolina, Diana, Canada, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Rome. Oh. Come on, exotic, uh, anywhere, Michigan, South, South Africa, Mexico. Oh. Keep them coming. I'm going to play the video ads uh, of our sponsors and uh, we'll be back for the presentation with Shell shortly. Slides are on. Uh, I'll be back for the Q and A after, but for now, I'll hand you over to Shell. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are tuning in from, it's so amazing to see where all of you are from. So um, it's great that you could be here today. I do really appreciate that. And the great thing about you folks being all over the world is that cockroaches really are a universal problem. It's it's not that we have this one species in Pakistan and this one species in Ghana and this one species here. It really is many of the same species. And when we talk about food facilities, it's extra challenging because we have food and that's what our pests want. They, they're looking for food. They're looking for water. They're looking for shelter. And so whether it's in our kitchen or whether it's in our food processing facility or food storage facility, this is what they're after. And we are we are providing it for them. So and if you folks have any questions as we go through this, please chop, <laughs> drop those in the chat or in the QA. I will try and keep an eye on that, but we will definitely get to them at, at the end. So when we talk about cockroaches and really any pest, but cockroaches specifically, why do we even care about it? I mean, they're an insect. We certainly don't want insects in our food. But, you know, really when we're talking about cockroaches, they are a very gross issue because they're a food safety issue. They can cause allergens. And we know that they are capable of transmitting quite a few foodborne diseases. So specifically when we talk about those foodborne pathogens, and I know this is really small, don't worry about reading it all, but um, this is from a couple years ago that they found that cockroaches could transfer E. coli, Staphylococcus, uh, Shigella, Salmonella, Listeria. So all of these things that can make food very, can make people very sick when it gets into the food. So the cockroaches can pick up little particles of, of these pathogens and transfer them to clean surfaces or food surfaces or anything like that. 
So in a food facility, we definitely don't want these things moving any of that around. It can cause huge recalls and lots of disease and even death in some cases. Again, not what we want. And while it most may seem a little strange to talk about allergens when it talk when talking about cockroaches, they've done a lot of research, particularly with uh, dense populations, inner city populations that that have shown that high levels of cockroaches, high infestations, can contribute to allergies. And again, this may sound a little silly. Why are we talking about this in food processing? But I have seen food facilities infested enough with cockroaches that employees are having allergic reactions and it's contributing to those allergens that they have. So yes, it sounds crazy that no food facility would ever have that many cockroaches, but I've seen it once or twice. So now you have employees who could be getting sick and we want to keep our employees safe. That's, that's definitely, they're, they're doing all the work out there. We can't lose them. And then, of course, um, other diseases, uh, WHO study found bacteria, fungus, mold, and viruses. Again, them picking up those little particles on their legs, on their mouth parts, on their antennae, and transferring them over. So bottom line, moral of the story is we do not want cockroaches in our food facilities, anywhere near our foods. And again, that's a challenge when we have this huge abundance of food in a building, in a structure, that's what they're going after. So a little bit of quick background on cockroaches. There are over 4,000 species out there, and most of them are just out there kind of doing their job out in nature. They, we, we never come across them. They're just, they're out there doing their thing. We're inside doing our thing. But well, we do have about 12 worldwide that are considered pests. These are the ones that will get into structures that are actively seeking out our food, the shelter that we provide for them, the, the environment. Most of these like it a little bit warmer, a little bit damper. Um, so those 12 species are really important to keep an eye out from. And I'm not going to go into all the descriptions of these and all the life cycles. Um, there's plenty of good information out there on identification, plenty of people you can reach out to. Feel free to send me some pictures. That's my favorite game of the day is what's this bug? So the big one that we really want to keep an eye on, though, is the German cockroach. Again, worldwide distribution. These are found all over. And these are the ones that really get in there and really infest. They develop rather quickly. So when we're talking about cockroaches, as with any pest that's out there, we want to use that integrated integrated method using all those tools that we have to try and deal with this problem. Because if we just spray some bug killer, sure, that may kill some of the cockroaches. But what about all the ones that are in that, that corner in that wall void that are hiding? So we really want to try and seek out the source. We want to look at sanitation. We want to look at how they're getting in, how they're moving around, and then do those pesticide treatments where and when necessary. Um, so Heather and I think somebody else asked too, are we going to share this? Yes, absolutely. We will share this, this presentation with you. So the first step in, in any good integrated method of, of pest control is identification. Like I said, over 4,000 species out there, we're only concerned with a few of those species of cockroaches. But when we identify them correctly, whether it's a German cockroach, whether it's an American cockroach, whether it's a brown banded cockroach, they all have slightly different life cycles. They all have slightly different areas that they're going to want to be in, slightly different food preferences too. So if we get to the point where we can say this is exactly what it is, we can already start to target certain areas. We don't have to look through the entire food facility. We just have to look at this one corner because that's where they're most likely to be and then work our way out. So it saves us a lot of time and energy just by being able to tell what type of insect this is and where it's most likely to be. So here's a good example for you. Um, this is actually something that I ran into a few years back. Um, we have American cockroaches and woods roaches, which kind of look about a similar. They're about the same size. They're about an inch, inch and a half, kind of dark brown colored. Our American cockroaches like drains and sewers. They like that, that wet, humid environment where there's going to be that food source. And so these are the ones that are going to come up through the drains. These are the ones that are going to infest certain structures. 
But woods roaches are typically outside. They're, they're like a termite. They actually live in wood and they break down wood. Um, so again, outside pests. But what we also see is that those American cockroaches are more after the human food, the food that you are producing, while the woods roaches are in that plant material. They're in that wood that's outside. So kind of weird. We, we would expect to see an American cockroach inside and we would expect to see a, a woods roach outside. Um, woods roach is very seasonal. We have them here in Georgia. They are just starting to pop up because our temperatures are starting to warm up here. So I've seen a few of them out there. But what happened in this food facility is that somebody thought, okay, it's, it's got to be an American cockroach because it's inside. Well, it turns out it wasn't. It was actually a woods roach. And this facility was a very old facility, so there was still a lot of wood in it. Um, they had built, originally built the facility out of wood and then added on to it. So unlike a lot of newer facilities, there are going to be a lot of concrete, a lot of hard material. This facility still had a lot of wood, and it was rotting. And so the woods roaches had actually gotten into that and continued to decompose that. So for about three months, they were treating the wrong thing. They were treating the wrong area, and the problem kept getting worse. Now, this is a weird situation. You're not going to see a lot, but it goes to that aspect of identity identifying correctly so that the problem doesn't continue to get worse. It's, it's like a misdiagnosis when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you have this, take this medication. And you keep getting worse and worse and worse because it's a misdiagnosis. You actually had this and should have been on that medication. So you can kind of think of it that way when it comes to that. But that identification is really important to key you in on a lot of those areas. And when it comes to cockroaches, it is all about food. And they often aren't infesting the good food, like the, the initial raw ingredients or what's being processed or even the end. They're really feeding off of a lot of that, that spillage, that debris, that off off the line kind of foods. Again, drains are a big one because when all that all that material gets flushed down when it gets a wet wash down, flushes down into those drains. And if those drains don't get clean, there's this huge buildup that not only is a food source for the cockroaches, but it, it's also a home. It's also protection for them. So this is, uh, again, actually from a food facility. Um, I can't remember which one this is or what they were processing, but it was a wet processing. Um, you see a lot of cockroaches in any type of meat processing, any type of wet processing. You don't see them too much in dry processing, though um, if you're doing baking goods, uh, they, they definitely pop up there because you've got a lot of that moisture again. So you can just barely see that drain. There's so much material that's kind of crusted over and into it. And this was one of the spots that our cockroaches were coming from. So being able to identify those areas with sanitation problems, even, even if that sanitation can't be cleaned up, at least you know where those areas are so you can keep a closer eye on them. Okay, and we also want to find, you know, the little spots that they're hiding. German cockroaches in particular are excellent at hiding. Um, there's this really great video that, that shows how much a cockroach can get squished down to squeeze into the little tiny cracks and crevices that provide them with that shelter. And if they're in that sheltered spot, how will a pesticide even get there? How does your treatment get to those areas to target that? And that's a very difficult one. So sometimes finding those areas and sealing them up to, to restrict their access to these little hidden spots. And when you think of it too, how much food has been pushed into those spots that provides them you know, areas that they don't even have to come out very much. Cockroaches are much like ants in that perspective because it's only about, 20 or 30 percent of that colony of cockroaches that is actually out and foraging, 70 percent of them are going to stay in that hiding spot and wait for those adults to come back and drop off little particles of food for them, and they're going to feed off of that. Um, so it's like having pizza delivered to you instead of having to go out and get your pizza. It's, it's perfect. Why would you not want to do that? So again, these tiny cracks and crevices, this is actually not very tiny, um, but door jams are a big one. The, the, the door frames around doors is a big one where I see because it's just such a high traffic area. It gets, 
gets kind of beat up and, you know, it gets kicked and machinery goes through it. So it winds up with these holes. And again, food can get pushed up there. Moisture can get pushed up there. So sometimes sealing up these areas can help to reduce that population that's out there. And our inspections can also lead to other conducive conditions. Um, when you, <laughs> this isn't exactly food material, but this is great shelter for all those cockroaches. Um, this is in a warehouse that, that was storing quite a bit of food. And again, all this, this material here, and especially once it gets a little damp, a little wet, that provides all that perfect shelter for those cockroaches that are in there. So when we look at that inspection aspect, we wanna try and fix these underlying conditions which again is much easier said than done because you're processing food, you have an abundance of food and it's not like you can get rid of all of that. So that's where a lot of the challenge comes in. So with sanitation, again, your inspection process should have shown you where many of these sanitation issues are going to be. And you know when you find them, again, it's not just food, it's water, it's moisture, it's shelter. Um, and it can be both inside and outside. This is from a food facility, and this is actually underneath a dock plate. So when the trucks pull up to, to unload, this is underneath that dock plate, and those cockroaches could easily climb up through the cracks and crevices in those, those dock door areas. Um, and you can see an abundance of food here. <laughs> you can see abundance of water. Again, perfect conditions. Now, this won't always stay perfectly dry and perfectly cleaned, but if it gets on that rotation of being cleaned on a monthly basis every other month, that's going to minimize the amount of food and water and shelter that they have. And there have actually been a number of studies that have shown if you basically starve the insects, if you give them very limited amounts of food, they grow, they develop much slower. They have a much higher mortality rate. So many of them won't even get to adulthood. And then when they do get to adulthood, they have much less egg laying. So the females produce less eggs, they mate less because they're so stressed out because they don't have enough food. They're not worried about mating. All they're worried about is surviving. So sanitation can go a long way but again, it's never going to be perfect, which is really hard. However, identifying those hot spots and making sure that things get put on a rotation so they get cleaned on a regular basis. Um, many of our cockroaches, the American cockroaches, take about a year to develop, which seems like a pretty long time, but remember, they also have quite a few generations going. German cockroaches can develop in less than two months if conditions are perfect. So if this drain is only cleaned twice a year, those German cockroaches have months, four months of time to get in there, to infest, to develop those populations, which can develop very quickly. Each German cockroach female can have as many as 40 eggs per egg sac and numerous egg sacs per their, their lifespan. So realizing where some of these areas are and addressing them, or if you can't address them, then these are target areas to think about inspecting more often, just so you can be aware when those populations do pop up. Um, I was just at a site not too long ago and they were having a little bit of an issue with those American cockroaches and they were coming out of drains. So what they did is they actually put um, like a, a very heavy mat. It wasn't completely sealed, but they put a mat over that drain so that when they needed to, they could lift it and, and still push stuff through that drain. But when they weren't using it, it, it almost sealed down, which kept many of those cockroaches down in the drain. Um, they couldn't quite clean it, but they could make sure that those cockroaches couldn't come up through the site. So again, when sanitation can't be perfect, there are still ways to work around that and, and to kind of compensate when you can't do everything there. Uh, sanitation in food facilities is especially challenging when you think of all the, the machinery that's out there. Again, I, I, I'll see if I can find it and send it to, to Simon, but that video that shows just how flat they can get to squeeze through stuff. And you think of all the equipment that's there and all those little vent holes, all those cracks, all those entry points that cockroaches can get in. 
And then of course, since you're in a food facility and this is, this is continuously processing, sometimes 24 hours a day, you have this buildup that can't get clean because that machine needs to be in use. So how often does that machine get turned off? How often can it get cleaned? So this brings up the challenge again of that food material getting stuck in there, that food material accumulating and providing that perfect habitat for cockroaches. Again, especially those German cockroaches that can just get in there and, and just hide. They've got everything necessary until those populations become big enough that they have to start scavenging elsewhere for food. And that's when they start coming out. And that's when you know that you have a big problem especially since if you see one cockroaches, one cockroach, one cockroach, um, it's likely that there's probably seven to 10 that are hiding away that you won't see. Plus these things are mostly nocturnal. So if you're doing daytime inspections and the lights are on and everything's bright, they're gonna be hiding away because they don't wanna be seen. But when the lights go down a little bit or there's dark spaces, again, think of all that processing equipment you have that's nice and dark that's a happy place for them. They feel protected there. That's where they're going to be. So even identifying some of these places where cockroaches might be can be a challenge. But if your inspection is good, if you're finding those sanitation issues, if you're finding those spots where food may build up, maybe it hasn't built up yet, but it may build up, you can keep a closer eye on that. And again, maybe you do extra treatments in those small areas. Maybe you put out extra monitoring devices, any of that. Now, many of you are probably saying, well, why are we talking about vending machines if I process food? Well, there are many areas in your processing plant that probably don't process food. You have break rooms, you have kitchen areas for your employees, you have locker rooms, you probably have some office areas. And what I find a lot is that some of these problems originate in those non-food processing areas and then they move into those processing areas. Um, vending machines, microwaves, refrigerators are, in my opinion, horrible because those areas don't get cleaned. Think about, think about your vending machine in your break room if you have one. When was the last time that got pulled out and cleaned behind? Because every time somebody washes the floor, they push that material up underneath that vending machine. That vending machine is warm because it's got a little motor that keeps everything running. So now you've got warm, you've got wet, you've got food, and you've got a safe dark space. So when we think about cockroaches, don't just think about your processing line. Don't just think about the sanitation that's out there. Also think about the sanitation issues that could be in other areas of your facility. Where else is food going to be stored? Food is gonna be stored in break rooms, in vending machines, sometimes in people's desk drawers. So look for those areas as well. Um, again, that heat source, when you think of that food processing equipment, that heat source, it just provides that, that beautiful little spot for them that they keep all nice and toasty warm, just like they like to be. And I mentioned that some of our cockroach species are outside species. We should also check the outside too. This is not as big of a deal with German cockroaches, but your American cockroaches can have pretty decent populations on the outside. If we leave them those doors, those windows, those cracks and crevices to get into the food facility, we are allowing them in. We are giving them the food, water, and shelter that they want and need. So taking a look around the outside of your facility, making sure that you have some vegetation free borders. So at the very least you can inspect those areas and look for some of those cracks and crevices. Uh, this again was, was at a food facility that I was at and you know the inside looked great, but they were having a problem with some pests getting in. And the pests were getting in basically underneath that vegetation that we couldn't quite see until we peeled it back that there were actually some holes underneath it that the pests were using to get inside. So it is about the outside. Think if you have any outside um, areas that your employees spend time on, maybe those smoking areas where they're having a bag of chips and a soda or outside areas when it's nice that they go outside to eat. Those have to be cleaned up as well because that's where some of that human food is gonna be and that's where some of our cockroach problems are going to start. If we allow those cockroach problems to get really big on the outside, just the chance of them getting in increases because the populations are so big. Okay, next with uh, cockroaches and sanitation, I know it's all about sanitation, but 
it really is important, again, to limit those populations, stress them out, and make sure those populations stay small while you are doing other things as well. Um, it seems kind of weird that I put a picture of plants here, but this was inside a, a corporate office of a food facility. Um, they did have food processing, but it was also their corporate office, and they had all these beautiful plants there. Unfortunately, that soil was all nice and wet, and they had a cafe that that's just the back of it. I think you can just see some some tables back there. So we have this beautiful habitat of all this moist soil. We've got food sources for that cafe, and the cockroaches were all in these planters, infesting these planters. So you will find cockroaches in some very crazy areas sometimes that you wouldn't necessarily think of it because maybe there's not actually food there, but they're still finding habitat and they're finding food nearby. So when it's been a challenge that you're seeing these things, sometimes they can come from challenging areas. So when we talk about sanitation, as I said, much easier said than done. We have to be realistic about this. You cannot eliminate all the food from your food processing facility. You cannot eliminate all the food from your food warehouse. You cannot uh, not eliminate all the incoming goods because then you'd have no food processing. So looking for those high risk areas, looking for the, the top three to five biggest concerns that maybe have the most amount of sanitation issues or are the ones that really can't be accessed very well, identifying those so you know where they are, so you know where to focus your efforts. We want to minimize the amount of food out there, realizing that we can't completely eliminate it. And that is that is hard. I mean, even think about your own kitchen. Um, I wouldn't be willing to get rid of all the food in my kitchen. So why would we expect that from a food processing facility? I mentioned that many of these problems can start on the outside with exclusion. So I, I challenge you again to look at all those cracks and crevices. If you, if you stand at a door and you can see daylight around that door, cockroaches can get in. And again, particularly with the American cockroaches, those are gonna use those access points. But also remember that that crack in that door frame, if we can seal up some of the inside as well as some of the outside, that can go a long way in addressing some of those problems. And of course, if we can just keep the doors closed, this is not a food facility. This is actually a restaurant that I was working in. Um, and usually all of these doors have the same sign on it that says, do not prop this door open or this door should not be opened. And yet that door is opened. Um, anything can potentially get in this door. I mean, we're talking rodents and, and birds even. So watch those entry points that the folks in the facility are using. We, again, just like sanitation, we can't prevent people from coming and going. These doors have to be open. They have to, to let people in and let people out. But the faster that they can be closed and making sure that they are sealed all the way around and people understand why, why do these doors have to be kept closed? It's so easy for me to just go out there and prop this open for the five minutes that I'm going to be out there. No, we cannot do that. We have to make sure that these things are, are closed because our pests can get in. As I mentioned too before, looking for those small points, those small areas and making sure if we can to seal them up because so many of those cockroaches are gonna look for those, those dark hidden areas. Wall voids are a big one, especially in food processing. Um, so sealing up as many of those as possible, not to allow them that hiding spot and to, you know, restrict their access. Just like we can't have perfect sanitation, we can never have perfect exclusion. We can never seal up every single crack and crevice. But if we seal up many of them, we limit the areas that they can potentially be in. So think about some of the areas, again, this is particular for German cockroaches that like to get in and, and really infest those areas. Uh, this is pretty important to find the bigger ones and again, try to address those. Again, little spots. Um, this is actually in an office area of a food processing facility. And this is where we had, we had started to see some of them in the processing area. And we sort of traced it back um, and found out that this was at the, the edge of an office area where there were vending machines, where there was food. And this is where it looked like they had started because there was a much bigger population here. So 
look for those points and and keep the inside even even those non food processing areas if it's an office if it's a break room if it's a locker room those areas are almost as important to keep clean and keep sealed up as your actual processing areas and they do get forgotten quite a bit but just like sanitation really look at the top three to five areas that you really need done um you know there's tons of sanitation issues, tons of exclusion issues, and it can get very overwhelming when you have a list of, of 200 things that should be done or could be done. Looking at the top three to five of those issues and then starting to work your way down the list as you can, because especially with door seals, things like this that we see, these are going to constantly break down. These don't last forever, um, depending on the type of door seal. Maybe it'll last five years, maybe it'll last 10 years, but eventually it is going to break down. So this is a constant effort to look at these sanitation issues, look at these exclusion issues and stay on top of them. It's, it's a little bit thankless and it's a little bit intimidating sometimes, but at the same time, you know, you, you take a bath or you take a shower almost every day. Um, doesn't stop you from getting dirty the next day, but you're still gonna keep that up. You're still gonna wash your hands, even though they're gonna get dirty in, in 10 minutes. So think of it that way, that this is, this is protecting your site from those cockroaches and making it a little less habitable, a little less appealing for them to be in. So one of the other things that is really helpful for identifying where cockroaches are coming from, again, they're nocturnal, they like to be in the dark, they like to be hiding. So sometimes our eyes aren't the best tool. So we have to use monitoring devices and monitoring devices are great because they're out there 24 seven doing their thing. Sure, your facility might be running 24 hours a day and your employees are always out there and, and keeping an eye on things. But at the same time, these monitors are in the back corners, they're in the dark, they're, they're by that, that material that you know you can't quite get, get cleaned up. And they're also a trap. I mean, they are also going to physically remove some of these cockroaches, but they point you in the right direction. Okay, they tell you what species could be present. Are we dealing with those American cockroaches that are maybe more for the sewers and those damp spots? Are we dealing with the German cockroaches that are gonna look for the warmth and, and more of the food? Um, so what species are, are gonna be there? What species may you have a problem with in your facility? And we also have a couple lures, um, a couple things, particularly with the glue boards that just make them smell a little bit better. Um, there's, there's some that are like banana scented and chocolate scented. And again, that, that food smell just helps to bring them in a little bit more. The problem with that, of course, is you are producing food, which also smells good. So how, how appealing is that lure? I don't know. But basically, you know, the, the way most of our insects and most of our pests are talking to each other is that that chemical sense, is that sense of smell, basically. And that's their way of, of doing things. So with cockroaches, that, that aggregation hormone, that hormone that says, this is a really good place that I found, why don't you come join me, um, can overpower some of those food smells, can overpower some of the desire to be out and about. But with cockroaches, we are primarily using glue boards. And again, this can show you where some of these problems are. For those of you with large food processing facilities, I mean, you may have hundreds of thousands of square meters to cover, and you don't want to inspect all of that just because you found two cockroaches. You wanna inspect those areas just right there where you did find those two cockroaches. So these monitoring devices, again, particularly the glue boards, are going to show us where these things are and where our inspection should target. And you can see on this glue board, um, we do have German cockroaches. Um, I see about two adults and one, two, three, four, five, six, six juveniles. So in any cockroach population, most of the population, probably about 60 to 70% is gonna be the immature stages. So. When we start seeing those, we know that we have that reproducing population. We know that we've got more than what we're just gonna see with our eyes. So the trick is, again, where do we put these glue boards? Where do we put these monitors? Um, and this is, again, 
you know, a, a little bit of a challenge because there's only so many places we can. Um, we don't want to put them out in the middle of a processing floor where anybody can step on them. And plus, that's not where the cockroaches are going to be. So we want to tuck them into some of those hidden areas. And we want to think about how those cockroaches are going to act and where they are going to want to be. And then put those monitoring glue boards close to them. And Heather, to your point about how some people feel about glue boards, it is a challenge. Um, I know for you folks in Europe, anybody from Europe that's on here, you are very restricted in how you can use glue boards. Uh, I believe that's probably coming in the next five to ten years in the U.S. that it's going to be more of a challenge because glue boards do catch everything. Anything that stumbles onto it um, is, is the potential to get caught. And that can be distressing for employees at the site too, especially if they have that attitude that, you know, everything, every life is valuable, which it is. So again, where we put those glue boards and how we place them, again, as much out of sight as possible, um, because that way, again, we don't have employees who are, who are getting distressed and we're in those areas that the pests are most likely to be in. So Heather, great question with that. And thank you for bringing that up because I typically forget about you folks in Europe who can't use glue boards. So when we talk about glue boards, um, you know, it's not just about trapping the, the pest. It's about seeing what it's doing. I mentioned that glue boards can point us to those areas where the cockroaches are. There's not cockroaches throughout your entire food processing facility. There's cockroaches, you know, just on this one processing line. So we can inspect that processing line so we can take that apart while everything else still goes on and does its thing. It also tells us what those populations are doing. Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they spreading out? Do we see seasonal effects to these populations? And I will tell you right now, with German cockroaches, we don't see much of a seasonal effect. With American cockroaches, we definitely see a seasonal effect. Even though it's inside, it's going to stay pretty much the same temperature year round with a little bit of up and down, but not like it will outside. They are still going to have that seasonal effect. This is also validation of if your treatments worked, if your sanitation worked. Say you found that big sanitation issue, you found that, that drain that was just disgusting that people had forgotten to clean. You finally clean that drain and now you can see, hey, all of those cockroach numbers went down. Our treatment worked. Our sanitation on that drain was effective. So the, the glue boards, the monitors just do so much um, that, that can be really helpful if you read them, if you take that information in and let it tell you a story. Um, and glue boards from the tropics, uh, you know, there are different types of glue boards. We have glue boards that are specifically for cold areas, again, because that glue kind of freezes, so special glue. And there's glue for hot areas as well. So, um, you know, different types of glue, different types of glue board pick what works best, different sizes. I mean, we, we have this cool glue board um, that's sold in the US that is actually 60 feet long. It's one foot wide and it comes on a roll and you can roll it out and cut it down to size. Very, very handy on that. So, um, and again, you know, tells you that story. Like I said, there's only two adults on here and there's a lot of juveniles. So we know this is a reproducing population. Um, the trick is with these, Again, what's the story? How often can you check them? Um, you may have an outside pest control company, a third party doing your service, and they should be doing this, and they should be telling you what they're finding and what that story is. Um, and if you're doing your own in-house pest control, again, same thing. Who's ever doing that should be recording this data, analyzing this data to tell you what's going on because these insects aren't just going to pop up and say hi i'm hiding in this wall over here and our populations are going up you have to read into the data that's going to do this and then have that corrective action so what so you caught a couple cockroaches on your glue board okay now what you have to do something about that um, and, you know, to the point of how close to the sensor should be the ground, in the U.S., we do not have any good electronic monitoring for insects yet, but they are coming. And with glue boards, you may not want to put it on the ground because, again, if it's, if it's a piece of equipment or if it's a hole in the wall, you may want to get that glue board a little bit more vertical, a little bit more on the wall versus on the floor. It just depends on where you think the populations are or what areas you want to monitor. And this is a perfect example to, to, you know, 
thank you for leading right into that. Um, where is your food? Even in food processing, you are going to have non-food areas of your warehouse, of your incoming goods, of your outgoing goods. So, you know, here we have a lot of boxes. We have, you know, a lot of plastic, you know, say this is your packaging material. But we probably don't need to monitor very much here because while there may be shelter, there's no food and I don't see any water issues here. So focusing our, our efforts on where they are most likely to be is going to give us better results. Now, we may have a glue board in this area. And if we find something, we know we need to inspect here. But chances are it's going to be in other areas where there is food, where there are drains, where there is that area that cockroaches are going to want to be in. And as I said, once we find them, we have to do something. We can't just say, yes, we found three cockroaches and move on with our lives. No, we have to do something about that so that those populations do not explode. So the big question that I get all the time is, what do we use for cockroaches? And it so depends on what your situation is, where they might be, what species they might be. So we have a number of options, which is nice because we want different options to deal with different situations. So we have a lot of different baits, which is really good. Um, I'll get into baits in just a, a little bit, um, but then we have dust. I don't like to use dust too much in food processing facilities because you don't know where that dust is going to go. And, and we do not want any type of food contamination with pesticides, just like we don't want any food contamination with the cockroaches. We have liquid residuals. Um, again, liquid residuals and food processing have to be done carefully so that we do not contaminate any of those food processing facilities or sorry, food processing machinery. We're going to like aim at the corners and the edges for those. Insect growth regulators are fantastic. I highly recommend them wherever you can apply them. And then when the problem gets bad enough, um, when that problem is, is widespread throughout a facility, you may have to start looking at a fogging or even a fumigation. So, you know, again, it just really depends. And ultimately, you want to follow the label of the product that you're using. For those of you folks who have an outside pest control company that's, that's doing this work, you should still know what products are approved to use in your facility. You should have an approved pesticide list that lists exactly what can be used at your site. Um, we don't want to use anything that is not labeled for use in food processing. We don't want to have that food contamination and we want to make sure it's applied correctly and safely. Um, safely for the food and safely for the employees that are there. If you're doing your own in-house pest control, again, same thing. You want to make sure that you have that list, that everybody knows how to use those items and make sure that, that they're doing it safely and effectively. I do want to go back here just, just for a minute and, and talk about baits a little bit more um, because baits are really fantastic. I, I've said a number of times that those cockroaches like to hide, so very few of them are actually out. So how do we get to those that are stuck up in that wall void that are hiding away? Well, we make them do the work for us. So we give that one foraging cockroach a bit of this bait that's, that's, that's a toxic bait, and we let it take its back to all its little friends that are in the wall void. And those little particles that may be stuck to them, plus cockroaches will eat their dead. So once that adult dies and the other cockroaches eat it, we actually have secondary and even sometimes tertiary kill. So we've made that cockroach do our work for us. We're making that cockroach take the product back and share it with all its friends. So baits are very, very effective. Problem with baits is you have to get them close to where they're foraging and give them enough so that they take it back and are able to affect the entire group of cockroaches back there. So again, baits are very, very effective, but all of these treatments um, are going to, you know, basically be dependent on what the situation is. And hold that thought for just a minute. I forgot my computer wasn't plugged in, so don't want the battery to die on me. All right, and as I said, liquid residuals, great, but you're gonna have to target corners, areas, and they might not get to those populations. When we get to the big parts, we have foggings and fumigations that can take out the, the big populations there. Um, uh, Marusa, from the experience, the number of captures to be significant. How many cockroaches do you want in your food facility? How many cockroaches is it acceptable for you to have? 
I say as soon as one of those shows up on a glue board, I am going to be doing much more intensive inspections in those areas. I might preemptively put down a little bit of bait so that if there are more, they can take it back. Um, and depending on where it is, if if that one cockroach shows up on a glue board that's by a door, and I know it's an American cockroach, I can suspect that that door maybe has a broken door seal and fix that. If that German cockroach shows up in the middle of my food processing, I know that I have to start inspecting those lines. So for me, one, I don't, I don't want any cockroaches in my facility. But the fact is, is what is your corrective action going to be there? You know, what, what are you going to do about it? Just because you find one doesn't mean you have to shut down the entire place for the weekend and do a fumigation. It means you can do that deeper inspection, look at what's going on. So again, it, it depends on what your threshold is for that. Um, oh, Nick, thank you for the importance of the, of the egg case. Yes. So with German cockroaches in particular, the female carries her egg sac called an ootheca big fancy word for an egg sac. She will carry it with her until it's just about ready to hatch, which means she's essentially protecting it. So again, that liquid residual probably isn't going to hit it because she's hidden up in that wall and the liquid residual is all down in those corners. And she's protecting that egg sac until it hatches. With American cockroaches, they will drop it a few days before, but still they'll put it in those hidden places where your pesticide is not likely to get to, which again is why I love bait so much because sure, that egg sac is still going to hatch, but as soon as it does, that infected cockroach with that bait, they're going to feed off of that one and those populations are going to drop drastically. Um, the big challenge I see with baits is, again, it's usually smaller placements. If you have a widespread infestation, you just aren't going to be able to put enough bait down. And number two, using enough bait. Um, Again, with the, the realization that so many are hiding, you have to give them enough to make sure you get back there. So, so Nick, thank, thank you for that, that comment. That was perfect. I'd forgotten about that. And it does come down to communication. Um, you know, it, if you're having that outside company do your pest control, they shouldn't just be dropping a piece of paper on your desk, you signing it and everybody walking away. There should be questions that are, are asked. Um, the, who's ever doing the service should be telling you what they found, where they found it, how many they found. And you should be asking that question of, okay, what should we do? Do we need to do more sanitation? Do we need to look at exclusion? Where should we look first? So that is very important to have that line of communication because everybody is responsible for this. You have a sanitation team. You, you may have a maintenance team. You have employees that are out there doing their job that can spot some of these problems if they're aware of what to look for. So communication is really important to catch these issues early. And when you do, we have a lot more opportunity to you know, treat these in different ways instead of it getting to the problem where it's huge and widespread and there's millions of cockroaches all over the place. And just remember, too, that this this problem did not start last night. Um, it probably started months ago. And so the problem can't be solved overnight. It's going to take a little time. It's going to take some effort. And there's not going to be an immediate result unless you're doing a fumigation, of course, um, that all of this is just going to magically go away. It's going to take a little work and effort. And remembering that and realizing that, yes, we have to keep up on sanitation. We have to maybe have to do multiple treatments, but those treatments can be small and targeted. Making sure the sanitation team is aware of where the key areas are that that they really need to, to focus on this week or next week or the areas that, hey, you know, this isn't so bad. So just go do other stuff. That's the key is making sure everybody's aware of what to look for. Everybody's aware of what they need to do to help with this situation. There we go. Next one. All right. And again, difference if you find an adult or, or, the, or the kids. I like how you put that one. Uh, it, it is. If you find a single adult, that could just be an accidental introduction. That could have come in on that pallet of goods. There's just one there. But if we are finding the juveniles, if we are finding the nymphs, the, the kids, that means there's there's a population that's there. There is, there is an infestation somewhere in that area. So just finding the one adult, again, I'd still do that inspection and still look around. But if we're finding juveniles, then we definitely know that there's a problem there. So make sure everybody's aware of, of what to do even to the people who are working there. Hey, keep an eye out. If you see this, make sure you tell this person. 
for your sanitation and your exclusion, make sure you prioritize those. It's, it's so overwhelming to get a list of a hundred things to do. But if you get a list of five things that, hey, if you could do this in the next two weeks, this would really help out. That makes it so much more manageable and so much more doable. And again, by prioritizing that, you can deal with the biggest issues first, which are going to have the most impact. And then your monitoring devices should show those populations going down. Uh, in the, if you're following any of the audit standards, AIB, SQF, BRC, any of the GFSI audit schemes, then you need a pest siting log. And it's really important to let your employees know how to use that and where it's stored. If they don't know where it is and they don't know how to use it, Nobody's going to use it, and those problems continue to build until somebody finally says something or, do, or does something. As well as if you're following any of those audit standards, you do need a site map of where all your monitoring devices are located. So make sure that is up to date as well. Um, I like to say if it can't be seen, it won't be cleaned. So check out those areas that you don't check out very often. Look underneath stuff. Look above above stuff, get up on a ladder every so often, get down on your hands and knees and look underneath that equipment. And when there is something like this, which, you know, obviously this can't be dealt with tomorrow, then focus on adding some of those additional methods that we've talked about. Maybe on the inside, doing that crack and crevice treatment because we know there's gonna be higher levels just inside that door that's around the corner. Maybe adding more traps to capture more as they come in. Being realistic about this. Uh, you'll hear a number of people say, just you know, clean up all the food mess and all your problems go away. Yes, but how do you do that? It's just not realistic. So try and keep, keep that in mind that we, we need to do enough and we still need to run the food processing. We still need to store the goods. Again, some of this stuff may be coming from weird places. Your monitoring devices should start to, to key you in. You can kind of follow them like a trail and they can show you where some of these problems are starting from and starting to spread off of. And then those monitoring devices, when you clean up all that wet soil and replace it with fake plants instead of live plants, have shown you that what you did just worked. So cockroaches, they are nasty. They spread disease. They're gross. Nobody wants them in their food. It's still IPM. It's still using all the methods that we have, all, all the tools that we have to manage this pass. That Those monitoring devices, again, can save you time. Instead of having to look throughout the entire food processing area, instead of looking through the entire warehouse, you can just look in that one corner where they're starting to show up. And then when we get to the, the product usage, when you get to using a pesticide, follow the label, use the product correctly, put it in the right place, and make sure you're using it according to the label. So it is not impossible. It is not impossible to do this. You can go, you will confront the problem, and you will solve the problem by being realistic about it too. So if you need any more information, uh, you can scan the QR code right there. And that is me. You can get to, to my information that way. Be happy to talk to you um, about what individual problems you're having if you want to reach out to me. And of course, we've got some time for questions. So if you guys start to put your questions in there, Simon's going to help me moderate that so I don't miss anything. Um, but until then, uh, thank you folks for being on here. It's, it's always a pleasure to do these and see people from all over the world. It's, it's fantastic. I love it. Brilliant. Thanks very much for the educational presentation. Um, let's, there's loads of questions, by the way. So, yes. <laughs> Hit me. Let's, yeah, I will. Just bear with me. Um, yeah, question from, uh, hi, Stigian. Uh, member of the month for February at IFSQN. Uh, how do cockroaches significantly differ from rodents in their behavior? It, it's a lot about size and it's a lot about reproductive rates. So 
cockroaches are just able to hide in more places. The, the food is going to be similar. I mean, cockroaches and rodents are going to scavenge for almost whatever they can find. Um, but cockroaches are going to be able to hide in a lot more places, and the, the reproductive rate is going to be much higher than rodents. So um, I, I think I figured this out once, that if you start with two cockroaches, by the time you get to a year, there's something like 500,000 individuals that are still potentially alive at that one year point versus rodents, where I think it tops out at like 100. Wow. Okay, question from Michelle. Is there a lower temperature that inhibits or decreases cockroach activity? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so all insects have that upper point and lower point. Um, with American cockroaches, that, that lower temperature, I want to say is somewhere like around 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but I'd have to double check that. And German cockroaches have a little less tolerance. So I think I want to say they're around 50 degrees Celsius that they stop. It has to be cold enough for long enough to kill them, though. So so you have that point where it's it's cold enough for them to stop and stop eating and stop reproducing. And then there's that temperature below that that's going to actually kill. OK. Uh, question from Vinod. Uh, is this special drain truck designed? Yeah, there is. Um, it was actually designed to prevent sewer gases from coming up through through drains. Um, there's a couple different models. Uh, Green Trap is one of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know that we have in the U.S. And it basically it allows water to go through. It's got this kind of neat little thing that that opens up for water to go through, but it kind of twists up and seals up when there's nothing going through it. So, yes, there are a couple of those drain inserts that you can find. Okay, question from Abdul. Uh, do we get a, uh, is there a book you can recommend on modern techniques to improve? Oh, IPL? um, you know, the, the Bible of pest control, if you want to call it that, um, in the U.S. is the Malice book, M-A-L-L-I-S, which is updated every few years. Um, so that's a good one. And I would just look at recent research, um, research papers coming out of universities that, that often have some good information. But those would be the two. Okay. Uh, a question from Mariam. Can we opt for prevention with respect to environment changes like with seasons changing the dangers increases and decreases? Yeah, so your monitoring devices will show you if there's that seasonal change and you can kind of kind of be a little bit of a, a weather person and predict that and say, OK, last year it started in April. So we know that in March we want to put a whole bunch more prevention and double check our door seals and put extra glue boards out there um, to prevent that from happening. So, yeah, you have to do a little bit of of predictive reasoning on that, but you can absolutely do that. Okay, uh, question from Vinod, another question. Um, any guidelines or standard available for integrated pest management? Yes, yeah, so the standards are use all the tools that you have, use all the resources that you have that are available to you. Um, again, every situation is going to change just a little bit. I threw out some weird ones for you, you know, with like plants in an office. Um, it, it really just depends. So using inspection, sanitation, exclusion, and treatments in whatever, and monitoring in whatever means you can. Okay, uh, question from Esther. Does it make sense to use night cameras to find where cockroaches enter? Oh, good one. Um, you'd have to have a pretty good camera. Um, but, you know, if you have a high quality night, night vision cam, I bet you could. We, we use night cams um, and game cams with rodents a lot, but rodents are bigger. So um, test that out and let me know. Okay. Uh, another question from Esther. Uh, can we say that a massive cockroaches infestation treatment is the most expensive treatment if we compare it with other massive pest infestations? Absolutely. And especially when you consider the shutdown time, um, with, if you're running 24-7, 365 days a year, you now have to shut down. So you've got lost productivity, loss of product, and all of that. So, yes, the bigger the infestation, the bigger the treatment costs. Okay. Um, Vinod, is it possible for employees to carry cockroaches from their homes to the food facility? 
Absolutely. You know how I said that a lot of these problems start in employee areas? Um, had a facility out in California that I worked with that those soft lunch bag coolers, again, are perfect. And what happens? People put them on top of their fridge when they get home where it's warm, where nobody sees, where there's cockroaches. And yes, they were finding that there were a couple employees that were actually bringing them from home. So once they got that figured out, they could stop the problem. But yes, those soft coolers, not the hard ones, but the soft coolers will definitely, definitely make an impact. Okay. Uh, question from Ravi Kumar. Can, in the food industry, can use boric acid with refined wheat flour to eliminate cockroaches? Uh, it depends on your label. There are boric acid products that I would recommend before mixing your own. Um, and boric acid products can work a little bit slower sometimes. So I would usually go for a bait first. Um, and then a boric acid product. And then if you have to mix it, you could, but that would be my third choice. Okay, another question from Bernard. Um, how can a pest control audit help, help identify and eliminate cockroach infestation in free facilities? Well, it can help to identify where they are. So hopefully you can <laughs> eliminate them. Um, the great thing about a, an audit is that it's usually somebody external coming in. So they can often see things that you might not have expected because you're there all the time. You know, you can get this bit of blindness sometimes. So um, an outside person can really take an objective look and tell you what's going on and give you the options for how to eliminate those issues. Yeah, great. Uh, another one from Mariam. Uh, how can we opt for prevention with respect to him? Oh, we've done that one. Yep. Sorry. Um, <laughs> And Nick, thank you for those links. That's that's great. Another question from Esther. Can cockroaches enter and stay in rooms where the temperature is 12 degrees Celsius? Yes, they can enter. They can stay there, but that's about all they're doing. At, at 12 at twelve C, they're not going to, once they get in, they're basically going to kind of shut down and be like, I can't move. Because they're, they're cold-blooded, just like all insects are. So when the temperatures get that cold, they basically just shut down and stop. And then, again, once it gets closer to that, that freezing point, there will be death associated with that. So they will get in. They will stay there. But that's it. Okay. Good. Jose, uh those glue traps with hormones that you present could be the same that we put into rodent traps. Is there something that could help us to prevent insects in soffit sealing? Absolutely, yeah. Our, our glue traps, at least in the US, um, are designed for small rodents, usually mice and insects in general. So yes, they, they are multi-use. We call them a blunder trap because basically anything that blunders into them can get caught. So it's not very species specific, which is good and bad all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, question from Bami Deli. How close should the sensor be to the ground for it to spot the cockroach? Again, I don't know of any current system in the US that is doing electronic control for uh, electronic monitoring for insects. I don't think that the technology is quite there yet, but I do know it's coming soon. So if you're talking about that, that digital monitoring, electronic monitoring, um, I don't think it's out yet, but it, it may be in Europe. I don't know. Okay. Um, question, a question from Vinod, any, is there any natural solutions available to control cockroaches? population in food facilities? Um, depends on your definition of natural. Um, the, again, sanitation is a very natural process to get rid of them. Uh, I, I believe in, again, using that integrated approach and uh, attempting to address all of those concerns the best you can, and then using products where needed. Um, sonar plugs? Uh, any any use sonar? No oh, use. Um, yeah, the plug-in sonar. Not that I can think of. Um, and no. if you know, if you're talking about those, um, also the the ones that like are supposed to emit sound, whether it's sonar or something else, completely yeah. useless. Don't do it. That all the studies have shown that they are useless at repelling or keeping cockroaches out of an area. Okay, Edwin asks, is there any chemical odor that cockroaches dislike? 
There are a couple pesticides that are considered repellent. So that as cockroaches get closer to them, it will repel them away. But in most cases, you don't want that because you want them to be treated. You don't want them to run away into their hiding spot. You want them to get that treatment. Um, so just check and make sure that the product that you're using is not a repellent. Okay. And Hussein asks, is there any way to control the eggs of cockroaches? Again, bait is, is going to be your best friend here. It won't control the egg sac, but as soon as those hatch out and start feeding on whatever bait is left over, it's going to knock them down very quickly. Right. And what about heat treatment? That was another question. Yep, heat treatment, kind of like cold that we were talking about. There's an upper limit to how, how they can basically move around, that it gets them to a stopping point. And then there's that limit that will actually start to kill them. Um, it's a it's a time dose response. So the more time, the slightly lower temperature, if you want to kill them faster, you have to use a higher temperature for a shorter amount of time. Okay, and another question from Stygian. We talked about some rodents being afraid of new things. How do cockroaches behave around new areas and changes? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, we haven't asked them, so I think we should go out there and, and survey our cockroaches. Um, no, it doesn't seem to affect them too much. They're just, they're looking for food. Um, the only thing that I can say that that's going to change their behavior is typically if there's a lot more light, like if you've moved that vending machine out and now there's a whole bunch of light behind it, they're going to avoid that area. So light is going to be your biggest, um, change that will affect them. All right. Uh, a question from Abina. Can you explain how the pest sightings log can help improve pest control? Yeah, because you have maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 employees out there. So if you are using their eyes and saying, hey, if you see this, let us know, they can let you know when they see that one cockroach on processing line four at the very beginning. So you know exactly where to go right now instead of waiting for you know four weeks down the road when the whole processing line is infested so you're basically using your employees as as pest control technicians and they are telling you exactly where to look as early as possible yeah are, are there any food grade pesticides available Yes. Yeah, so again, read the label, follow the label. Most baits are allowed as long as you are not putting them on food contact surfaces, which is not a place that I think you even want to put them. With liquid residuals, again, that, that usually depends on placement. So be very careful about the placement. Um, but, you know, my recommendation is that depending on what you have in your area, depending on what you have in your country, read and follow the label. Quite a couple more questions uh, from Teresa. How will the fogging process be? Yeah, so if we're doing a fogging, and think of fog as those tiny little particles of, of liquid in the air that have to contact the pest in order to kill it, it's usually a shutdown of at least a day, depending on how big your facility is. And again, people will come in with the product and, and the machinery to make that a fog and literally push that fog into the area that you're treating. Again, the, the challenge with this is it is contact. So for those that are hiding behind the walls that will not get contacted, um, they will not die. Okay. Um, and from Minolini, uh, should, so we talk about temperature, weather conditions be a matter of concern. Absolutely. So I, I'm here in, in Georgia, in the U.S., we've had a bunch of warm, wet days. So I am starting to see a few of those woods cockroaches get into my house. I cannot figure out how they're getting in. I've inspected the whole house. I swear I've fixed my door seals, but one or two always get it. And it's because of the wet weather outside that's that's pushing them around. So absolutely keep an eye on the weather. Okay. Um, and a question from, from Julie. Uh, is it relevant to place traps all along the production line to improve tracking and therefore reacting to a catch? Um, that's a good question. I would say what's reasonable and where can you put them? Again, if you have if you have the space that they're protected all along that processing line and you are willing to check them every few weeks, 
absolutely go for it. Um, the more, the better. However, you know, there's that, that time investment that you have to make too. So if that time investment in placing them and checking them is worth it to you, go for it. Yeah. And uh, manage is trending helpful in decreasing population because you can get less in the first phase and then next time you get more. Yes. Yeah, so I, I always want to see trending. I always want to see, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it moving? Um, trending can tell us a lot about those populations. And like you said, it may have gone up, but then we have to delve into it a little bit farther and say, why did it go up? Um, is it because we did that treatment and maybe push them around a little bit more so we are seeing more? Um, that's why you look at trending over time. It's never just one or two points. You have to look at it over, over months when you're doing that. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. I think we'll have to leave it then. How difficult is it to find the nest? That's from Marrow. Um, sometimes it's relatively easy. You find one glue board with 20 of them on there and no other glue boards with any. And so, you know, it's right in that area. Other times it can be really challenging and it can take you months. Um, that, that situation that I showed you with those live plants indoors, it, it took us, I think a good six months to really figure out where they were coming from and do something about it. So. Yeah, and, and on that, where's the best place to start with glue boards? first that's from Vanessa in in areas that have food or are close to food in dark spots and in areas that are a little bit warmer so like it, again if you have that refrigerator motor you know behind that refrigerator is a perfect spot underneath that processing line where you know you have a bit of spillage and it's dark yeah. and it's warmer uh Delsha is bait more effective to use in food establishments Again, depends on the level of infestation, but yes, um, my recommendation is always go with bait first. You may go with bait and a liquid residual, bait and a dust, but bait is going to be one of the most effective things you can use. Okay, and uh, what about e eradication methods in an organic food facility? Yeah, organic can be a little bit of a challenge just because of the steps that you need to go to. You can still use conventional pesticides in an organic facility. You just have to go through the steps to get there. And if you want more information on organic, I've got tons of that. I, I don't want to don't want to delve into that too much. So contact me if you want more on that. Okay. And question from Vinod: How can we identify and verify the service provider is using the right chemical for pest control as per government regulations? you should have that approved pesticide list and you should be checking what they use um, when after at least in the us and in europe in most places after you do a pesticide application you have to document that so if i'm going in and doing a fogging i have to document which chemical i've used how much of that chemical and then turn that into you so you can track is what what i used on the approved pesticide list yeah Okay, on that, then we're done. We're 12 minutes over, but brilliant, uh, amazing presentation and lots of great questions. And uh, watch this space, everybody, because we're going to be bringing you some uh, longer, uh, more in-depth training courses with uh, Shell on all aspects of pest management. So thanks for your time today, Shell. Have a lovely yeah. weekend. Bye, folks. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I've loaded your certificate in the sidebar. You can download that. Uh, you'll have to add your own name to it, print and sign, or open it in image editing and, and type your name. And then uh, we'll follow up with an email afterwards with the recording slides and your certificate again. Uh, thanks for your attendance today and engaging. It's been brilliant. Uh, we'll see you uh, on the next one. Have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.